Right, I think we are on now. Right. Is everyone set in the room, my friends? Yes. Uh, Peter, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everyone. Hi. Um, I I see people chiming in already. So this seems to 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 be an exciting session. Just like by look of things here, seems like we are we are all fired up. Um, I'm seeing Hamdi Farah joining in. I see Kasti joining in. I see Justin joining in as well. So it seems to be a really good conversation. So before we dive right in, um, I'd, I'd really love to give a quick brief, really quick, high level on, on how we got here. So how did we get here? Maybe how we got here can be very interesting. I'm just trying to, to find out like something that members or people out there can actually see so that I can demonstrate how we actually got here. So my guess, can you confirm you can see my slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good yes. one, interesting. So as you see Karibu, Karibu means welcome. So first, let me welcome you to, to Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, although we are, we are virtually in Nairobi, if you see what I mean. So welcome to Nairobi, Kenya, where the United Nations 2024 Civil Society Conference will be happening. So the beautiful place, except that I'm told that the floods are all over the place. I am sure that we won't be carried away by the floods. But first, how did we get here to this conversation that we are going to have today? A lot of things are happening and the sustainable development goals are off track. They say that only 12% of the sustainable development goals are on track. Yet we have to achieve the goals by 2030. And we have several civil organizations, societies, non-governmental organizations, academia, um, and all the private sector. Are they playing their part to help achieve the sustainable development goals? If yes, why then are we on 12%? On why are we where we are today? Look at the environmental issues, the climate change, the health, and a lot of things. Is everybody playing their part? And if not, what can we do differently to create a better future for all? And if I did not introduce myself, feel free to call me Peter. I come from, from Global Youth Forum and a member of Intergenerational and Youth Subcommittee team. And this conversation is going to chime more into how can the intergenerational groups work together to achieve the common future for all. So now I'll welcome all my guests now to introduce themselves. I'm not sure where to start, but let me start with, with anyone who, who wants to, who feels is ready. Go on then, I'll, I will, Peter. There was, that, there was that pause, so I jump in. Um, uh, I, I know Peter very well. Uh, Peter and I work a lot together, although I live in the UK. Uh, I'm Gareth Davis, and um, my first language was Welsh, second was English, and um, I uh, am the chair of the Board of Trustees of Global Youth Forum. Thank you so much, Gareth, and welcome. Now I got to nominate somebody, Kirsty. <laughs> sure, thanks, Peter. Thank you for having me. So my name is Kirsty Shakespeare. I'm the International Sustainability Education Manager at the Trust for Sustainable Living, which is a UK-based charity that works globally to support young people and teachers to learn more about sustainability. Um, and we've been working with Global Youth Forum for a couple of years now, supporting various programmes empowering youth with sustainable development. All right. Thank you so much, Kasti, for the work you do. Now, let me jump to Hamdi Farah. Hamdi, where are you tuning in from? Hello, everybody. I am tuning in from Nairobi, Kenya. My name is Hamdi Mohamed Farah. Uh, professionally, I'm a medical doctor. I am uh, the founder and executive director of a national organization called the Climate and Health Connect, working in the region, uh, working in Kenya, the arid and semi-arid region of Kenya. Uh, my favorite SDG, uh, SDG uh, is goals. Fifth one, the gender equity. 
and uh, 13, climate action. Thank you. All right, there we go. Farah is coming. I'm glad she has not been carried away by the floods in Nairobi. Justin, where are you tuning in from and who are you, by the way? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Justin Mokua. I'm tuning in from Kajado, Kenya. Uh, I've known Peter for the last two and a half years. We have worked with Peter uh, at first as a Fodontia at Kropo Youth Forum and later as an intern, Secretary General at Kropo Youth Forum. Uh, my favorite SDG is SDG number five, gender equality, and SDG number four, that's quality education. Thank you. All right. I think that was wonderful. And members who are joining in, or if you are watching this live, remember our hashtags, hashtag 2024UNCSC and hashtag we commit. Remember to share with friends, tag those you want, and also put your messages on the comments on this on the Facebook page. And if you are joining live in like Alia or Ilma, drop your questions on the chat. We'll be keeping our eyes right there. But I know I did not ask you one thing, my friends, or I didn't, I didn't hear it. <laughs> what change do you want? What problem do you see in the world? Okay. I'm curious about the, the biggest problem you see in the world. It can just be a single statement. Can we start with Gareth and go around like how we did? One statement. Gosh, Peter. Um, I would say general inequality. Gender inequality. So meaning you... No, no, no. Ge general. General inequality. No, no matter where or what. Inequality. Okay. okay. Inequality. I got to think about that. Kasti. Poor sustainability education. Poor sustainability education. Okay, good one. Hamdi. I will say gender equality, where I see women are not included in several sectors like politics, economics, business. So yes, I will say big issue I see is gender equality. Equality. Okay. Justin, your issue. <clears throat> Uh, I have three issues. Number one is gender inequality. Number two, war. And number three, injustices. Justin just, Justin just went overboard to give us three, although we asked <laughs> one. So Justin, I will excuse you for that, but well done. Now, I want you to remember that because at the end of this conversation, we will come back and double back to that. And that's why I did ask that keenly. So now then, if we dive right in and just get started, I know I got a number of things over here and you guys saw all this and, and many, other, many other stuff. So the overall views of the sustainable development goals before we, we look at everything can form the pillar of our discussions. And I see members over here ad advocating for uh, goal number five, gender equality. I see here climate, I hear decent work and economic growth. Gareth Ewers probably seems to cover all this, but we will dive right, right into that to find out more. And maybe you guys <laughs> might have seen this flyer. They look handsome, they look beautiful, and they will give us beautiful and handsome content. So stay tuned <laughs> and use the hashtag we've just given you. Um, Gareth, this is not necessarily for you, but I want you to, to just like anyone watching this or joining in, I want you to watch this carefully. And Gareth, I know we've worked on a number of years. Mm -hmm. we've, we've connected through scouting. Now we are with Global Youth Forum and we do all sorts of things. Yeah. As members look at this, for example, I'm just trying to, to, to look at it as well as I think. So I look at that and I look at the world's population standing at 1.2 billion young people between the ages of 14 and 25. In your career, I know you have worked on many other things and with many other people. What are the, some of the challenges that you encountered working with these young people? Because sometimes they say like in, in Kenya, they say that almost 60% of young people are not employed and they complain about a number of things. As an individual, having done the work you do, what are some of the challenges you faced working with young people? And again, tell, combine with some of the opportunities you've seen when working with young people. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> firstly, Peter, I think I have to say that my view tends to be fairly different than most people of my age. Um, and um, as, as well, you know, I don't, I very rarely talk about my age, but I do talk about the awesome and amazing trips I've had around the sun. And um, this year I will complete um, 65. I saw my 65th trip around the sun. 
And um, it's been awesome. It really has. And part of that obviously was as a young person, um, albeit a little while ago. Uh, and that's what often we forget. I think people forget quite simply their what it was like to be young. And yes, it was different in my day. We didn't have the layers of technology that you have nowadays. You could escape quite easily. Nowadays, social media, everything is always there in your hand on the phone. So technology is a big thing that's changed. Um, and that puts a different kind of pressure on young people. And the speed at which change occurs, I think, is the bigger is one another major difference. And therefore, the need to adapt quickly. Um, young people are very good at that. We were never trained in our lives to do that. <laughs> um, although I worked for an organisation that if we didn't have a change after six months, we all started looking around a bit concerned as to why we weren't changing. Uh, and I, I spent my career in technology um, working for um, Hewlett Packard at the time. Um, now, you know, all those things start to apply pressure to young people. Communication is so different. Um, you know, we, we did have a telephone that was tied to the wall and on a cable. Uh, <laughs> you did have, yeah, and they were dialed, yeah. <laughs> you did have, we did have such things as um, going out and seeing our friends. And that was probably, about, oh, we could send letters, you know, and you drop them in the post. So all that has changed rapidly and the response that young people expect back is so different. That applies pressure. And I, I see it in young people. So it, the biggest difference, the amount of pressure that young people are under. And quite often people of my generation tend not to, well, they just look back with very rose tinted glasses, I have to say, <laughs> and, and um, say, well, you know, it's, it's, it was different in my, just, just take your time. Young people can't nowadays. If they take their time, they're left behind. Um, and that is an incredible pressure. Um, and the other thing is around mental health. And mental health was never spoken about when I was young. Um, we played outdoors. We did all that kind of stuff, which we now encourage people to do um, as, as a normal thing to do. Uh, and so in terms of differences and challenges, um, it's how you overcome each one of those and understand and actually, it was being relevant to young people and listening to them, because believe me, I know very well that you give them the responsibility and young people will, will, no doubt, will rise to the occasion. They always do. And they will take on responsibility. They will take on any challenge. <clears throat> they may do it differently than I would, but that doesn't make it wrong. <laughs> that makes it different. And the outcomes are the same. And it's those outcomes are, are what are important. And it's enabling people like me and my generation to change enough to take the risk of letting young people do something. Okay, Gadeth, are you taking the risk and allowing the young people to do something? We will come back to that. Yeah. I, <laughs> I will. Come, I will leave you. I'll leave you to answer that one, Peter. <laughs> yeah, I will come back to that and say because you mentioned something on risk, but just to 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 double back, you touched on technology. You touched on adaptability and how those have changed or have shifted a number mm -hmm. of things that you, you see, you've seen in the generations. So yeah. I'm, I'm looking at Hamdi uh, on this other side, being a founder now, like in a medical space, working with these young people and doing all these sorts of things. Hamdi, they say that young people can't do these things, but I'm just like, I'm just curious to hear you being like working on the medical space and being a founder of an organization like of your own organization, what challenges do you see when, when working with these young people or even the older generation? And what opportunities have you also encountered working with both the young people and the older generation? Um, talk to us. Thank you, Omundi. Thank you. That was a brilliant thing. So yes, uh, I founded the organization four years ago uh, while, when I was 25 years old in medical school. And uh, I will say it's all about passion and just being a humanitarian because I started while I was, I was in school, I started as a UNV. I also volunteered in community activities. I am trainer of trainee for SEA and gender-based violence. I train as well. I got a lot of experience because of the exposure I was given 
while I was in volunteering. So, and I tend to have a lot of great ideas and innovative ideas. Then I decided to like found an organization because uh, when you're volunteering or when you're an employee, you tend to be limited in decision making. You tend to not ex like uh, experience or practi like practicalize your, your ideas. Once I founded the organization, I feel pleasure writing my own proposals. Uh, I feel I feel good engaging uh, young and older people as well uh, to make my innovative and uh, and creative ideas practical. So in the process, I tend to interact with both young people and both um, older people. Young people, they're very energetic. They have a lot of energy. They have a lot of ideas. Given the chance, they will actually bring uh, brilliant uh, practical ideas on the ground. On the other hand, working with older people, they are rich with experience and wisdom. That's one thing I would say, and I am so like seeing it without fear because they coach me through. As a young person, I had some places that I thought there was I was doing well, but with experience they had, they like and the ideas and the coaching they did for me, I tend to appreciate working with both uh, older people and both youth people. Thank you. All right. Um, Hamdi and Gareth, I will also come, come back to you. Hamdi, can you highlight one biggest challenge you encounter working with both the groups? Here, I'm just like very specific young group, the challenge, and the older people, the challenge. Right. You've, you've given us that, the only one side of the coin. I'm curious on both, by the way. So go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. So one challenge uh, that young people have is they're very energetic and the, the energy tends them to uh, tends to tell them that you can do a lot, but limited time. And they have to do a lot of things in um, short time, dividing their time and uh, uh, managing work time, social life balance, that's a problem I've seen with young people. Uh, one challenge I've seen with older people is some of them are rigid to change and change is inevitable. So you bring some great ideas and because they, they know they are some, some things that won't work in their head, I'm sorry, maybe, uh, they tend to be rigid, some of them. And because of that, it takes long time to explain to them uh, how your idea is going to be practical unless you become now uh, resilient and you go for your idea, you practicalize it, and then after that, they appreciate again and support you. Thank you. Okay. Now, now we are speaking here. Now we have both the positive and the other, the other things that we can improve on. But you highlight really good, good things in terms of youth being energetic, being mm -hmm. again flexible, the, the, the older generation having wisdom and experience. And now the young people, again, this their energy confusing them that they can change the world in one day. And then the old on the other side, they, they are stuck with their old system. <laughs> really, really deep insights there. Kasti, I come to you now. But because for you, we've done a lot of things since, we, since our paths crossed. You do things with the international schools. You do students debates from like across Africa, Europe and everywhere and you just reminded me this morning that you you had also even worked in thailand so i must have forgotten that but now now kasti look um they say africa or like when you are you go to europe they see africa as a country and they say africa is like developing country or things like that and you having worked from with people from across the globe what are some of the challenges you you've experienced either working with the teachers and the students from across the globe. What, what are some of the challenges and the opportunities you've identified when working with these uh, people from various continents? Just curious to hear. Sure, and I think it's interesting. Um, actually, some of the challenges are globally universal. It makes no difference whether you're from a developing country or a more developed country in terms of sort of, especially teaching. Um, there is a huge gap in teacher training and teacher knowledge, particularly around sustainability and climate education. And, you know, some countries are pushing through their national curriculums and through their governments for more sustainability education. Some are not pushing for any, but there's no sort of additional teacher training happening to help teachers understand and deliver this new education that they're being asked to do. So 
um, you know, my favourite sustainable development goal is number four because it's so integral to what we do. And especially around sustainability, education is the core of everything. Um, but there seems to be a real um, sort of disconnect, perhaps, between what we're expecting of teachers to deliver to young people um, without equipping them with the skills and training and knowledge that they need as educators to be able to pass that on to young people. And I think that reflects in the challenges that young people are facing is that, you know, they are energetic, they have got ambitions, but they don't always have the confidence or the direction to be able to know how to make changes, where to make changes and how to have an impact. So that's one of the things that we've really seen at TSL is teachers and students asking for help on how they can be empowered, how they can take action, what steps they need to do and how they can learn more to improve their own knowledge, which I think is something we need to look at education systems and how they can be changed to better support teachers that we're expecting to educate and young people that we're expecting to, you know, to lead the world and take over from us in a few years time. Um, in terms of opportunities, you know, I think there's a fantastic opportunity there. Having these kind of conversations, we're seeing more and more intergenerational dialogues happening. Um, slowly but we're getting there and I think that's really important that youth are provided with opportunities um, to share their thoughts and ideas and that there are adults and business leaders and political leaders that are willing to, to have youth at the table and have those conversations so still a lot more work to be done but I think certainly over the last couple of years there's been a lot more youth engagement in decision making processes that are going to be impacting youth in the future. All right. Okay, now you 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 bring across the part of education. I will give you a quick story here in Kenya, which can take me like less than thirty seconds. You you can imagine a new curriculum is being developed, and then the trainers are placed on a weekend to cover the the new curriculum training, <laughs> and then they are they're like, go now and deliver. And I can I can tell you that that hasn't turned turned out to be really good. So I'm like. Yes, we really need to 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 work on the teachers and and the curriculum to empower people because for those who are into IT into IT like Gareth will say garbage in garbage out. So if the teachers can't deliver what is needed, the students will be the end product of that. Maybe Gareth will intervene, but just shortly on the on the on the computer language I've just thrown in. Gareth, I'll come to you on the garbage in garbage out element. But let me bring Justin. I know Justin is graduating this year and he has been doing a lot of things under Global Youth Forum. Justin, they say within our system, they just say like um, 2.9 million, like let's say over a million Kenyans enter the job market every day. And the employers are complaining that you guys are not graduating with thing, like with the, with the relevant skills that are needed in the job market. You as an individual having volunteered at Global Youth Forum, now you are moving on and doing all these things. What challenges do you see among the youth? And what challenges have you seen working also with the older people? Let's see your angle and then look at what Hamdi shared with us so we can compare the notes there. Justin, jump on. Okay, thank you. Uh, looking at uh, most employers, yes, they are complaining just the reality that the youths don't have the relevant skills. Uh, first, I could go with the education curriculum in Kenya. When you look at it, there, it has some gaps which makes it impossible for the youth to acquire the relevant skills uh, which are relevant in the job market. It's, uh, for example, look at the uh, education system. In, it's result-based. We focus more on results rather than the competence. When I shared, yes, results are good. They create a competitive environment. But again, uh, when we focus more on results, we hinder the creativity, innovation of students. We have to empower the youths with the skills which are relevant. Let's not focus more on grades, uh, which grade a student has scored, and encourage them to be more creative, uh, to create solutions to problems which are relevant in 21st century. So my, working with the with the older people, although I've not worked for a long time, maybe as well for youth for them, uh, that's where I've worked and some other organizations, maybe as a volunteer. One of the challenges is uh, adaptability to change. 
the older people, they are somehow resistant maybe to technology. They don't want to change easily. You have to convince them that this is the best alternative. Getting out from their traditional methods of doing work, it becomes a great challenge on how to move from this to this. So that's what maybe I've encountered uh, for the meantime. Okay. So Justin seems to be young in the field, but I see Gareth, you are coming on. But wait, Justin, Justin. <laughs> they say young people have issues and I know even you are issues and I know. Gareth, do you want to jump on over there? Just like we summarize this first initial bit of like <laughs> challenges and opportunities we see. So any guests is welcome now to just like we can use another two minutes to add what you feel has been left. Gareth. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, everyone has commented and, and I would view correctly about certainly what I see out there um, in the marketplace uh, around young people and the intergenerational piece. Um, I was fortunate by working for such a high tech company at a time when the industry was moving very quickly. Um, believe it, in 1983, when I joined the company, I was given a terminal and a old modem, you are the ones that used to squeal away, um, and to take that home. And I used to work, I was remote working. Um, and I've remote worked all of my working career. Uh, I'm used to that kind. Of, I'm not a technologist. I, I, I'm a business consultant within HP. I was. Um, uh, and um, uh, so, you know, I don't do that, that the technology in that sense, the deep technology, but a use of. Um, and that's what it's about. Uh, the, the digital piece for me is about how you use it. Um, I absolutely believe, and I know we've used um, Justin a number of times, um, I'd like his views really, uh, when it's come to making some big decisions and the board has to make some large decisions. Um, it's Justin, I tend to turn to, to say, hey, what's your view? Because his is the important one, the really important one, because that that is the one as the young person there, and we are about young people and doing what is right for young people. And, um, you know, when it comes to those kind of things, it came to um, appoint a CEO, a very senior executive, and that's yourself, Peter, uh, and you know, going through the interview process and all the rest of it, we had Justin on that board um, because it was important that young people were there. It didn't just be, it wasn't just old people or the board, it was young people. That's important. All right. There we go. So Gareth is coming on to bring like, let's say there is a point there that it might be hidden, but incorporating these young people into the various boards. So like when, when we come back to Justin who said, oh, 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 Gareth, people like you are very rigid when it comes to convincing them with technology. They want to avoid that as like plague. It's like, we don't want and we don't want to learn it. Casti, oh dear. So we find it really hard because once a mind is set, I just don't want to, I'm not bothered. It's so hard to, to actually like change their minds to, to get them. But then on the other angle, Gareth, I've worked with these older people and the young people. I will say to sort of, they, they're like, they are slow because sometimes Hamdi, a young person comes with all this idea and energy, but then now you put them to task, they leave you alone. <laughs> it's like, we can't do it. So you find the older people are so slow until they buy into what you are trying to tell them. But if you prove yourself, I can confirm to you, they will give you more opportunities. I just wanted to add that. Yeah. Um, so all that the young people really need to like, in terms of what we are speaking about, I'm just looking at what you guys have stated, prove yourself. Because I know when you founded your organization at 25 years, I know now you are able to deal with more young people, more older people than you are when you are finding your organization. Cassie, do you want to chime in to throw in a word so we spend this last minute wisely? Yeah, I do. I think it's interesting to, to note as well, thinking about what Gareth said, the speed of change, particularly within business and industry at the moment, is phenomenal. You know, there's been hundreds of years worth of developments really in the last 20 years in terms of technology and our capabilities. And thinking about what Justin said, our education system isn't keeping pace with the change that's expected within industry and within the world. So we're still using a, a Victorian almost education system and methodology in terms of the way we assess young people, in terms of what we're asking them to learn, how we're asking them to learn it and the skills that education thinks are important. And actually, that's so far behind in many cases what industry is wanting. I think, you know, we're sort of 
setting young people up for failure almost with such an archaic education system because they're not coming out with the skills that they need for work because education changes aren't keeping pace with the real world. All right. Yeah, yeah it's an interesting, interesting comment has just come in, Peter, on, on the uh, about the language being used and, um, you know, uh, should it be elder people um, because they're, they're quite, quite old to, to a five-year-old, um, a 30-year-old is old. Uh, actually, to a five-year-old, I think I think a a fifteen-year-old is old. Um, <laughs> um, but but uh, you know, so perhaps we you know, language is important uh, yeah. as well. Um, and sometimes you know, referring consistently to young people, um, uh, we should have a youth representative. We should have that actually can be the right. No, we should have a rep, you know, people are representing all various groups, and that's it's as straight, straightforward as that. Um, hence my comment earlier about inclusivity. Um, you know, so it, it is just being being inclusive in all those areas uh, and language is equally important in that. So thank you. OK, I see a hand up. Prophet, I'll come to you shortly. Just just a second. But Gareth, I want to stay on with you on here. Now, we as Global Youth Forum, and I know many people, you look at the World Bank and everybody, Casti, what you are doing. We are looking to eradicate poverty. Like eradicate poverty everywhere, get people to live comfortable and get people to have like decent life and call that uh, our common future or anything you want to call it. Got it. We got the children. We got the youth. We got the middle aged. We got the medium there and we got the high end. What ideas do you have that can help these various groups or the intergenerational groups work together to probably create that common future for all? And you can even call it eradicate poverty everywhere. I'm curious on your top three ideas. Oh, top three. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so the one that overrides it, that I, I found most successful is any groups or committees or whatever that I that I've sat on and that ultimately become chair of. I work to a position where there can be a co-chair, yeah. and the co-chair uh, and it is co-chaired. It's not one is senior to the other. But there is a one one of the more more elder people and someone who is a younger person. Um, now that co-chairing, um, so long as it's done in the right frame of mind and the right thinking, is superb, um, and works so well and sends a huge message out about things. So, just by pulling those those two sides together and having a single co-chair. Uh, the message in any organisation, in any any group, small group, even you know a local group, just gathering to to arrange Sunday teas, say. Uh, actually, if there's a co-chair, and uh, you know that message is so so incredibly powerful um, that that, that uh, it really does make a huge impact. So that, that that's my my top one, uh, and one I highly recommend um, co-chairing. Um, but it has to be co-chair. It is co. <laughs> um, no one is more senior than the other. Um, uh, and then I, I, I guess then it comes down to, again, it's very practical on the ground things for me um, in in the recognition of doing. Um, you know, now, um, back in the 1990s, we used to, I, I spent a huge amount of time with organisations and companies talking about how they move from a knowledge-based company to being a wisdom-based company and, and how do you generate wisdom and what is wisdom and, and this kind of thing. It was one of the fads that we went through in computing in those days. Um, and um, actually what that's about is allowing people time and communicating. So again, this is about communication. It doesn't matter about age, actually. This is about good, solid, robust communication. And it is about recognizing those people that have knowledge. And the most powerful thing you can do with knowledge is share it. Some people think it's hang on to it. It's not. That's not powerful, really. The most powerful thing is share it. And once you start sharing knowledge, then that wisdom level around the whole organization, not just yours, but the whole thing increases immensely. So number two, share stuff, you know, share, share it, share, share information, share knowledge. Um, and that, that really does empower everyone. Three, I haven't come prepared for three. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let someone else have a go. I've had, okay. sure 
for my time, Peter. <laughs> oh, very wise, very wise, very wise there. But yeah, yeah, really good. Just share the knowledge. And the co-chair, I have issues with co-chair. I will come back to that co-chair <laughs> element just now. But I want to bring Hamdi into this conversation again. Hamdi, we have floods everywhere in Nairobi. I don't know if even the conference, we will be carried away by the floods. But um, probably you can use, say, the first one minute to tell us what, what like inspired you to start your organization to deal with climate and then tell us how can the intergen groups work together to probably combat the issues on climate and then we will come back we will come to to Kasti and Justin on, on on other things as well so Hamdi jump on thank you once again so what inspired me to tackle climate change first of all <clears throat> I come from uh, the northern part of Kenya where climate has really affected we have extreme heat waves we have extreme droughts and uh, growing up young I faced uh, uh, temperatures of 40 degrees going to school. So, uh, and getting experienced working in international organizations, volunteering, working with the community. I have one-on-one -on -one, uh, contact with the community and everybody talking about climate and climate issue has been the real thing all this time. So I founded uh, four years ago, as I said earlier. So this four years I've been hearing climate, climate, climate. And coming from the background of medical, so I was like, whatever I'm going to found is going to tackle the climate change and how uh, this climate change is affecting the health of the human and both the environment. Mm. So how to, how to mitigate this is, first of all, I will say uh, education and uh, creating awareness. Uh, the more you educate the community, the more you educate uh, people around and create um, campaigns that are like, there is climate climate change is being talked everywhere, but it's not going to to the far reach the the grassroots. So the more campaigns, the more creating awareness, the more people will be resilient to tackle the climate impact on both humans and environment. The other thing is interconnected solutions. When you are coming up with solutions on uh, climate resilience actions, then we need to include both the elderly and the young mothers and male, female, everybody, so that we can, people might not talk about it, but uh, communities have great ideas on their, so on how to tackle the climate action and its, and its effects on the people. So interconnected solutions. The other thing is uh, policy advocacy. Whenever policy is met, let's implement, let's advocate for policy advocacy. The other thing is community, <clears throat> one of the other thing is community resilience actions where we have uh, drought resistant, uh, resistant uh, agricultures. Whenever people are farming, let them farm um, crops that are resistant to drought. Uh, when it comes to floods, let's have in infrastructures that are resistant to floods. Because for example, we have, we have seen in the news and everywhere that roads being carried away by floods and the whole place uh, is a river. So if we have infrastructures that are literally um, resistant to these floods and maybe have higher bridge where if in case maybe the river is trying to uh, uh, break its banks, then it's not going to affect the transportation of the area, then I will say such solutions should be uh, one of the top so that we can have a better uh, resilient community. Thank okay. You. Uh, Gareth, you need to catch up with Hamdi sometime because she gave just three points you gave too. So, uh, there <laughs> are three, so, so. <laughs> but there we go. Maybe you donated your time. Now, uh, really good points. Policy, interconnectedness, the community, resilience, and all these topics, really insightful. So just bringing people to work together towards achieving a common agenda, really nice. Kasti, I know there is a debate coming up. I enjoyed myself last year where students wrote some really good content. And I tell you, reading those things, I want to read more. It's like a new book for me. It's like getting those generations give their ideas. I don't have to buy a book. I just come to TSL and watch at their debates. But when I was reading them, Kasti, I thought maybe their parents are teachers and that those parents wrote, wrote those essays for them. Oh, well, we will, go to, we, will, we will find out. But now with, with all the work you do, Kasti, all these things you do, what, how, like, working with teachers to prepare these young people for a better future. Now, what do you think 
can be done to ensure that the teachers can co collaborate sustainably or effectively with their students to get us to get young people who are prepared for the 21st century work workspace, entrepreneurial space, or this chaotic world that we are on now. What do you think are some of the good ideas? You can as well aim for three ideas, if you like. Okay. I'll try. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, an overhaul of the education system is, is very much needed in terms of the training and support that is given to teachers, uh, not only that are currently practicing teaching, but those students that are at university studying to be teachers. You know, we need to be equipping teachers with the skills that they need to understand new technologies and how they can be utilised, also to understand the expectations of industry. Um, you know, so there's going to be a more close collaboration there um, between what industry expects and what schools are able to deliver so that we can reduce the gap that we're seeing with students coming out of schools and universities lacking some of those skills. Um, so I definitely think sort of better support of, of teachers and educators is really important because, you know, if they don't have that support, how can they pass that knowledge, thinking about that sharing onto, onto young people? But also I think having a, a dialogue and an understanding in changing that education system of what young people want to learn, because obviously that the world has changed so much and our curriculums haven't necessarily kept up with those changes. Um, and I think the different ways that young people want to learn, I think most countries, most classrooms are very much students sat at a desk, teacher standing at the front, pointing at the whiteboard, dictating to young people, which is not for every young person an effective method of learning and isn't necessarily equipping young people with the, the competencies um, that Justin mentioned and the practical skills that we want to see. So are there ways we can change the way that we are learning um, and the opportunities that young people are open to um, through schools. And we can only really do that with dialogue between teachers and young people and those people creating curriculums, but also bringing in the business and industry side. So I think a, a, an intergenerational, but a sort of cross organizational collaboration is needed as well to better equip young people with the skills needed by allowing teachers and industry to understand what they need to deliver. Um, so kind of multiple ideas in there. And I think another thing is, you know, creating space for these intergenerational dialogues to happen. So you mentioned our student debates and our education summit, which is a space we create bringing young people and industry experts across all kinds of industry areas, academics, business, politics, um, and a create a safe space for young people to ask adults these difficult questions and for adults to better understand what young people want. Um, and I think intergenerational learning, be it at school or be it through work placements and through uh, industries, is really valuable as well. So when I worked in Thailand, I worked for a company called Tritop Three Generation Community, and their whole ethos was around parents and grandparents, those lifelong learners, learning alongside their children as their children were going through school and recognising the value that parents and grandparents can provide in terms of cultural knowledge and historical knowledge but also that perhaps they might also need updating on what their young people are learning um, and the skills that young people are developing as well. And that's, I think, an idea that could be really well put into business perspective, having different people across all layers and levels of the organisation learning together so that we can bring the older generations up to date with the young people on the newer technologies that are coming out and how they can be applied and then share some of that knowledge and expertise from the higher levels and the older generations with the younger generations. So I think, you know, creating opportunities, be it in schools, be it in businesses, be it in other settings, as, as TSL does, for these dialogues to happen, I think is really important. Okay. Um. I'm like sat here thinking, Kasti, uh, do I do I want to learn when I get to 70 or 80 years? Well, I might not want to learn. It's like, <laughs> I just want to go and sleep. But I know Gareth will come with a different opinion. You know, so, one you of my add? favorite phrases is every oh, day is a school day. Oh, okay. <laughs> Doesn't matter oh. how old you are, you're never too old to learn something new. Yeah, and the, the one I tend to say is, is the day that I stop learning, because I think learning is so 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 important and and, and um, my father was an educationalist and, and he always used to say that uh, there's a huge difference between teaching and learning yeah and the real art is getting your students to learn so they will lifelong learn okay. um, 
and um, uh, for me, the day I stop learning is the day they tighten the screws on that box that I will uh, <laughs> take my yeah. final journey. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. So, so, so why I did bring that really quick, because this day is Kasti, and this relates to the topic you've touched. A teacher comes with a chalk, and he or she stands in front of you, dictate notes, and does all these sorts of things. In real sense, you can actually just use your phone, <laughs> go, go Google or use chat GPTs of this world to find all that. So what can we teach students that they cannot find on chat GPT and all these other platforms that the technology we have? Because I see somebody was saying on the chat, yeah, let's call them the elder people. So the elderly, the elderly says, well, I think I have experience. So I got to teach them through chalk and talk. Well, your experience is on Google, my friend. <laughs> What can you engage these young people to do to get that through acting? So then I bring Justin into this conversation. Justin, now, we just did an analysis from a research we've done purely under Global Youth Forum practically, and we discovered that there is a 15 years gap between somebody who has graduated in, in say, in Kenya and wants to work in Europe, for example, in terms of the skills that the field needs. How then, Justin, do you think, I will tell you those skills and those gaps sometime, but maybe you know them based on like what you've done with us. What do you think can be done to bridge the gap between the education system so that when students graduate, we have like a hundred percent transition into, into job? So uh, what will your thoughts look like? This time I will just give you two. You, 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 you pair with Gareth, so you say two. What can be done? to ensure that the bridge is, 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 is filled such that when students graduate, they get straight into work in relation to the Kenyan curriculum or Kenyan context. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter, focusing on the Kenyan curriculum, uh, it's, it's reminded me one of the units which I learned while right on uh, university, uh, and I liked most uh, about uh, the Brazilian educationist who was Paulo Frel, who was against the curriculum which most of the countries were focusing, that was focusing more on memorization rather than creativity and innovation. So looking at the education system of Kenya, I compared it to what Paulo Fred was talking about. So to, to bridge the gap, we have to redefine the curriculum. And thanks to the Kenyan government, I think it has done well. It redefined to CBC, which is a very good curriculum on my thoughts. Uh, if we put more effort uh, funds on this curriculum, I think it's one of the best curriculum which will help, help students to have the critical thinking skills, the creativity and the innovations to be problem solvers of, of this uh, world. Number two, it's uh, bridging the gap we have again to focus on funding. Uh, looking at the Kenyan education system, it's somehow expensive. It becomes uh, cheaper to those who can afford, but uh, the poor people, all the less privileged are not able to afford education. And this again is making a, a big gap between those uh, who are learning and those who are not learning. Many students are not uh, getting education. Why? Because they don't, uh, they cannot be able to afford the education. So we have again to see how can we uh, ensure all students get affordable education. Also, uh, on education curriculum divination, we have to look at the relevant skills, which uh, will help the students to be empowered with the 21st century job market skills. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I see a prophet have dropped us an, 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 a poem. I love to deeply read those poems, my friend, really good. Um, but yeah, look at what Justin now is sharing. A lot of things are coming. So I will post there again and just go around to, to, so you guys can have one minute each to just react on what we've, we've stated. So filling the gaps and ensuring the intergenerational groups can work together. So maybe if you had one thing that you wanted to add in 30 seconds, please feel free to jump on. And then uh, we, will, we will take one or two, three questions at the end, my friend. So stay, stay locked. Remember mm -hmm. to use the hashtags, hashtag mm -hmm. we commit, hashtag 2024, U, 2024 UNCSC. So anyone with any other comment to add? I, I think I shared with you and with uh, Kirsty um, the other day when we were, we were having a, a session about planning some other stuff. Um, 
the staggering difference between some of the work my grandson's doing, who's just started school age four and a half, mm -hmm. and what we didn't do until we were in senior school, um, you know, in, in the first or second year of senior school. And he's four and a half and doing that and quite complicated mathematics. And, you know, you go, whoa, hang on a minute. This is quite a shock. Uh, it was to me that they're doing at that age, four and a half. Um, critical thinking. They do critical. They have a day a week where they have a lesson. Critical thinking. Um, I absolutely applaud that. That's so good because it's about problem solving and all this kind of stuff, which in in the workplace we need so much. Um, but how many places don't even start that until you know you're in the later later stages of education? So it, it's it's quite incredible, but positive. All right. There we go. Cassie, do you have something to add? And then Hamdi, do you have something to add really quick? Yeah, sure. I think it's uh, interesting thinking, you know, when you talk about writing on a chalkboard, what's it, what's it important to teach? And I think it is. It's the interconnectedness that Hamdi mentioned. It's the problem solving. It's the critical thinking. It's the systems thinking, I think, that are the important skills that we're probably missing in a lot of cases, rather than, you know, this is the answer to A, B, C, you know, is equipping young people with the abilities to question to be lifelong learners to you know not take things at face value and investigate further and understand the interconnectedness especially thinking about sustainability of everything but also the interconnectedness of intergenerational actions and the role that young people can play so I think those are some of the perhaps the key skills that are maybe missing in a lot of education systems at the moment that are going to be vital for young people okay Good one. Hamdi, Hamdi, before we give Ruth, Ruth, and then, and then, and then I think Prof also did raise a hand at some time. So, um, Hamdi, tell us something. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, majorly everything has been said, but I will add one thing. Uh, one thing I will say is uh, including uh, when young people, uh, let's say the in kindergarten and at the primary level, when skills are uh, being taught in that level, I uh, see like the CBC right, right now, the, the education system that's happening in Kenya, uh, in <clears throat> teaching children uh, skills rather than cramming and uh, preparing for exams is a way better to change the future than uh, what has been happening previously. Thank you. All right. Because you Thank mentioned you. that, Hamdi, I'm like... If I, if I may just add one, one other thing. Mm -hmm. For me, it's about respect. I don't have to agree with someone's views, but I can respect their right to have that view. Um, and I respect their, their position on that. And that is, um, you won't learn that on Google, You won't, but it does generate a much more tolerant and a much better sharing society if we can do that. So respect. Okay, I think good one there, because I saw Nicola say something, and I think that might might answer his question. How can we promote the protection of dignity of young people? Maybe somebody can just answer that really quick before I bring Ruth to ask her question. And then uh, we, we Justin will come back to you shortly. Yeah, Prof, you will go first because you raised your hand initially first. There we go. Thank you. I can't OK. Um, are you guys able to hear me by by some? Yes, I can hear you, Peter. Yeah. So, Prophet Ani Aniwanyu, do you want to unmute and speak to us? Yes, thank you so much. I just saw this post on the um, WhatsApp, and I'm glad I jumped on. Uh, not really a question. I, I am uh, 74 years old, but I uh, help and help out and support someone that's 93. And they move so much faster than I do. Like they can take a drive between states. They told me yesterday should take four hours, but they can get there in an hour and a half. So I guess what, as I listen to the conversation, I'm hearing sort of a flavor and I'm not to be, not to be derogatory about it, but there's a flavor and I think it's global about aging. And uh, I know I have friends, I'm in U.S., but I have friends in Africa. And when, we, when they ask for support for elders, the elders are like 60 and 70, and 
they feel like they have already like retired and they need a lot of help. And, you know, so they have this view of elders as pretty much worthless sometimes. And I just posted in there about centurions. My grandmother lived to be 107. So I think education, but I think it starts early. I hear the curriculum and stuff, but I think by the time young people get to their 20s, they've kind of formed their opinion of a lot of that I'm running into is that how useful are elders because they're thinking that we're kind of over the hill and don't have a lot to bring to the table. So I think education and changing mindsets, first of all, about elders and what's possible, what they can bring to the table. Also, some of the friends in Africa, the elder seems to be the one who maintain culture. They have the land. You know, they know how to farm. They know the secrets of farming. They have a lot that's being lost, even with educated younger people, because the schools aren't teaching it. So I highlighted on there about accurate knowledge. So there's one thing to go to school or college, get a PhD, but don't have accurate knowledge. So in the economic arena, which I look at, I'm not a, a professional, but I've taken it upon myself to study it. There's a lot that would help with poverty prevention if we just understood financial, economic, and, and history. If we study the history, nothing is new under the sun. One of the traditions of Sankofa, go back and fetch it if you've forgotten, that there is, we go back to history. I didn't know that a bond, B-O-N-D, was an IOU. I thought it was some tangible, powerful, you know, a millionaire kind of an asset. But all it is is a piece of paper that says, I owe you some money. And so people spend a lot of money on things that aren't valuable. So just knowledge of how the system works, how it started, all the great empires that failed because of debt. There's just a lot to be learned that you'll never get in the college because it's not taught. That's not the intent of the college is to put you into a workforce. So there's just basic knowledge that needs to be accurate all over the world. So that's what I say. And young people believe that they have a lot of new ideas. And so even for them, if I were doing it, I have a, a master's in education, but if I were doing it and it was free to do, I would give them accurate information because they believe as my grandchildren do, that they have a lot of original ideas and they can have, but what they're working with 99% of the time is something that somebody else fed into them and they move on that thinking is their bright idea, but they're really just following the latest trend, but they do have genius. I, as an elder, I believe they have genius. I've seen it. And I've seen them, if you give them a problem, that they'll come up with something, but they have to dig deeper because they don't understand that what they're being educated into is to stay in the system, work in the system, and that's what you do. And you only go as far as the system allows, but there's knowledge. That's why they have secret. I'll start with this. Yeah. yeah. The, the proof, the proof of it. Yeah. Okay. The proof of it, what I'm saying is if it were not true that you can't get it all in college, we wouldn't have secret societies, but every group, every country has secret societies that you have to be allowed into before you get that level of knowledge. So all you're going to get in school is what's needed for a system. Okay. I'll stop. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think we need to organize another session. Gareth, I'm coming back to you to just bring Prof uh, into this deeply conversation and just have like that wisdom come our way. Um, but let me, let Ruth, can you just jump on in less than 30 seconds and share, have your say as well before I get back to my guest to, to take us home so we, we, we don't run extra, extra, extra time. So Ruth, jump on. All right. Uh, sure. Uh, greetings, um, Peter, and greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Ruth Nawaki from Zambia. My contribution really is about inclusive education for learners with disabilities, the young people with disabilities in our communities, which is a sector which is overlooked and left out in most of the discussions. So my concern really is about uh, being inclusive, uh, more inclusive to ensure that um, the youth or young people or the children with disabilities are not left out in our discussions or in the in the process of making our policies, educational policies, the changes that are taking place and all the discussions, we should ensure that we focus on um, sectors or solutions that will promote the well-being of our persons with disabilities at all costs. Okay. So when we look at inclusive education, what is there for our 
learners with disabilities? Are we focusing on their disability or focusing on their um, capabilities? What is it that they can do with their skills? How well can they change the world? When we talk about um, the issues of technology, the world is becoming digital. How well are we going to be inclusive so that even the persons or young people with disabilities are not left out in all the changes that are taking place? Thank you. Okay. Now, I think, I think we will do more of this. But now, before we run home, I have always this general question. We just don't want to come over here or go over there, go to this conference, talk, 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 and then leave. Now, I know we started with the, the problem we are seeing in the world, Gareth. Now, I will allow you to rest there. Justin, you gave us your last statement. Can we start with you? What will you do to solve the problem you have identified in less than 30 seconds? If you go one minute, I'm okay. But this time, I'm, I'm keeping time, my eyes on the time. 30 seconds. What will you do that I can come and say, Justin, what did you do, by the way? So, Justin, what will you do to solve the problem? Okay, thank you. Uh, for the viewers who had not yet uh, joined us, my problem was uh, gender inequalities, war and injustices. Uh, to resolve gender inequalities, one, we have to recognize these gender inequalities are there. They are facing both women and men, and let's not focus one more on other gender leaving out the other gender. So we need to have strong institutions uh, and legal mechanisms to solve this problem. Uh, on the issue of war, we have to come together and seek uh, solutions as a community. How can we end this war in our communities? How can we end war globally? So we need to have strong legal mechanisms and cooperation. Let's cooperate instead of fighting one another. Thank you. Okay. Let me go to Hamdi. What will you do to solve the issue you have, you, you highlighted or... Yeah, thank you. I highlighted gender inequality. Uh, to solve that, I will say maybe let's include uh, women in decision making. Let's include women in politics. Let's include women in big positions, in leadership positions, both in business, in academia, and in politics everywhere. Okay. Include the women everywhere. I will also it's champion the, the, the men and, and the men. And climate I... action. <laughs> yeah. uh, in climate action, uh, let's include youth, both youth and, and um, elderly, to come up with the decisions, uh, community resilience uh, um, campaigns, so that we have a community that is resilient to the impacts of the climate change. Thank okay. you. There we go. Um, Kasti, over to you. Sure. So thinking about, you know, improving sustainability education, TSL is dedicated to creating spaces for this intergenerational dialogue to happen, particularly around sustainability, but also improving uh, to support for teachers and for students to help empower and educate them in sustainability. There you have it. Gareth, now maybe you are time to give us your third one. that you I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick up on, a, on a, a number of little points first, if I may. So these are outside of my one minute. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I think importance, safe space for all, for everyone, um, is, is the real thing. Sadly, we, we talked about history and, and learning. We don't learn from history, unfortunately. Um, we keep repeating the same things again and again. Um, and we don't learn. Somehow we have to learn. We have to take that knowledge and we have to turn that into the wisdom and, and not, not keep repeating the same things. And just because it didn't work for my generation, I shouldn't say that won't work now. No, nope, you're not going to do that. No, nope. It might be the right fit now. Okay, Just because it didn't work in my generation, that may be the fit now. Um, and therefore we should give young people that opportunity. Um, Peter, you've heard me say, I don't mind how many mistakes you make, just don't make the same one twice. Yeah, because we learn by our mistakes, so learn from them. Um, coming back to, to uh, my goal, as you know, is eradicating poverty, goal number one. I actually think if we fix that, we fix all of them, um, because then inequality disappears, because you know, poverty is gone, we can start, and it, it will fix, just about everything that doesn't mean there won't be some trimming and, and and little bits that need doing but in terms of big picture if we could fix 
poverty and eradicate poverty, then I think we have solved most of the issues. And we keep it solved. That's the other thing. Not just solve it today or, to, or tomorrow, but keep it solved. Okay. Okay. I know we are, we are just, I did request for extra time, but now I'm bringing it home, my friends. And I know we will do more of these sessions. Let me look at my, my last, what is on my last presentation? Like just, sorry. Um, what's on my last presentation somewhere over here? So we can see exactly what, what's going on. But to bring this home, I will say to the civil society organizations, going to Nairobi, or those that will not make it. We can all talk. The things have been done the way they've always been done. And that's where we've always gotten the results that we have. Unless we change our minds to do things differently, listen to every voice, do what will get us the results, it does not matter how many talks we have around the globe. If we don't do anything, we don't change our actions. We don't accommodate each other. We don't collaborate. We don't partner. We might not get there. But we, the hope is there. We can change the world, but only if we choose to. So with that, I say thank you to all my guests for tuning in today. For all of you who have joined us, it was like a really quick notice, but we wanted to share something to bring the voices that have always been left behind. I know some of you can't make it to... To, to Nairobi, but now you are starting to share your voices. Farah, I know I will be meeting you over there. Justin, I know you, you might miss. But those of you who are out there, let's make those commitments. Let's follow that through and let's act, act to create a common future for all. So I say thank you and I look forward to connecting with you again. So thank you so much. <laughs>